for everyone? Nice. Okay. So as you can see from the slides, uh, we're going to be talking about Haskell for writing services, network services in particular. Uh, a lot of the concepts here are going to apply to other things as well, but obviously Twitter is very much interested in writing network services. That's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, I'm Michael Snoyman. I'm the uh, Director of Engineering at FB Complete. We're the leading provider of Haskell tooling. Uh, I'm also the author of the SoGub framework, lead developer on the stack build tool, and a few other open source projects. So the first question is, what is Haskell? Why should we care about this thing? So throwing some ideas out there. It's a strongly and statically typed language. This is something that is very important for, you know, going back to those adjectives on the first slide, it's very important for making robust applications. You're able to ensure a lot of things about what your programs are going to do just from the type system. It's purely functional, also known as having explicit side effects. So when you look at a function that says it's going to add two numbers together and give you another number, you know it's not also going to fire the missiles or anything else along those lines. Immutable de by default means I can take a piece of data, pass it off to a function, and know that that data is not going to get mutated behind my back, which as, we see, as we'll see later on, very important for doing multi-threaded applications. Uh, Haskell gets compiled down to native code as opposed to something like the JVM or being interpreted, which gives it a performance edge in many cases. Multi-threaded runtime is a very powerful feature. Anyone who's familiar with, you know, something like Node.js, uh, callback hell, anything like that, you can say goodbye to that in Haskell. It doesn't exist. Uh, I won't make fun of JavaScript too much in this talk, but I may not be able to hold back. Um, <laughs> And then the final thing is, we've got this really cool feature in the primary, so the main Haskell compiler is GHC. This talk is basically about GHC Haskell, not about general Haskell. Uh, it's the most widely used compiler, so just from now on, if I say Haskell, assume I mean the GHC variant thereof. Uh, the other really cool thing is that Haskell's become a playground for a lot of interesting things. So there's a lot of type level work going on that's very fun, dependent types. That's out there. You don't have to use it, but if you feel like experimenting with something new, it's there. Uh, on a more mundane level, you know, just dealing with making things faster, which, you know, whoever does that, uh, we have these things called rewrite rules, which allow you to really easily jump in and pretend like you're a compiler writer and make things faster, and we'll talk about that in this talk, too. So we're going to cover a bunch of these things today. Just glance at this. Depending on time, we may not hit every single one of these. Uh, I'll make the slides available online later for any topics that we end up missing. But we'll start off with single core performance. So forget about any kind of multi-core threading, parallelization. We're not going to go there. How do you make a simple algorithm fast? One of, the first, one of the first things that people get concerned about when they hear that Haskell is immutable by default is doesn't that generate a huge amount of data in memory? Don't you have this massive garbage collector overhead? And the answer is no. The answer is that the garbage collector in Haskell is very well tuned for this kind of use case. Uh, we can, the, the basic way this works is that we have something called a nursery. Data goes into the nursery first and is only promoted after it's re, uh, remained in the nursery for some time. That means that temporary objects, of which we do create quite a bit, those temporary objects get garbage collected almost immediately and don't cause memory fragmentation when they disappear. Uh, we have gener a generational, a copying garbage collector. I'm not that deeply familiar with it. I take advantage of it without really having to know the magic that goes on behind the scenes. So, uh, there's some good information on the Haskell Wiki for those who are interested in it. The advantage of doing the, this immutable data structure in Haskell versus something like on the JVM, we really are designed to handle this out of the box. Lots of other systems don't have that design built in. Another fun trick that you don't get in a lot of other languages is data unpacking. Uh, so I'm hoping people are familiar with the syntax here. We have this data type foo that has a data constructor foo that takes two parameters, two ints. Now, looking at that first version, it's going to take up 56 bytes in memory because you have a pointer for the data constructor, you have a pointer to each of the ints, and then you have the ints themselves, and you have the int constructors. You can do the math there. However, by making some minor modifications, 
we're able to get this thing to be unpacked in memory. And now instead of taking up 56 bytes, it takes up 24 bytes. You don't actually need those unpacked pragmas. I'm just putting them there for demonstration. What we've done here is made two modifications. We put the bang patterns in on the strictness annotation, which is the exclamation point. That tells us we don't need to deal with creating any kind of laziness here. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the idea that Haskell is a lazy um, language. Instead, by making it strict, GHC is able to do some stuff in memory. It's able to put this all into one contiguous block, which is much more efficient. So now we have a data constructor, foo, and we have two ints, 24 bytes. Not only is this good for memory usage, it also means that as you start accessing these members inside the data structure, you're not doing all of these jumps. You're not doing these pointer indirections, and therefore you're going you're to be able to take better advantage of your cache lines. This is an improvement over what a lot of other languages are able to do. In C, you're able to you know, unpack things directly into a struct, uh, but as soon as you get into a language that's built around references, you lose a lot of this. So in Haskell, you get the choice. You can either have, uh, you can have boxed representation, which you, see, which you see above, or you could go ahead and you can unpack this and get much more efficient memory usage. Okay. But what's even better is you don't just get to do that for primitive types like ints. You can even do that for complex types. So we have the same foo that we had previously. Now we're able to unpack the entirety of foo into this bar. And the advantage, now in this case, we do have to say unpack because it could have a performance degradation if you end up updating part of bar without updating foo. Don't need to go into the details there. But you do have this flexibility, this control in Haskell that you lack in a lot of other languages, which is a really nice feature to have when you want to optimize at the low level. Oh, and also uh, something to point out, people often worry about having to deal with space leaks in Haskell. If you start doing things along these lines of making your data field strict, a lot of the space leaks that people run into uh, when they first start writing, they just disappear and it becomes something you don't have to worry about. A library that uh, I'm very fond of, many people are fond of, and it's a great demonstration of a lot of the perform. Yeah. Sorry, one quick question. What do you mean by space leak? Sure. So in so we have lazy. Sorry, I should have described that one. We have something called so we have laziness in Haskell. In Haskell, instead of when you theoretically when you say three plus four, you never you don't actually compute three plus four. What you do is you say, well, at some point in the future, I might be interested in what three plus four does, and therefore. I'm going to store three, I'm going to store four, and I'm going to store addition. And this, all, this whole thing becomes a closure captured by a thunk. And then, at some point in the future, I'll evaluate that thunk. Now, anyone here can probably easily figure out that three plus, seven, three plus four is seven, and that's a lot easier to calculate and remember than remembering three and four in addition and a pointer. Uh, Haskell is smart enough to know that three plus four should just be evaluated immediately, but there are more complex examples where that doesn't happen. So you can accidentally keep this laziness around and then hold on to a whole bunch of extra information as opposed to just the results. If you, oh, here, I'll go back. If instead you just unpack these things and make everything strict in these cases, you, as long as you're holding on to a bar and you know you have a bar, you know that it's going to be, and once it's evaluated, it's what's called fully evaluated. We can talk, this is the difference between weak head normal form and normal form for those of you who want to look up the information later. All right, so vectors. Uh, I'll be having a few slides devoted to this because vector is a really cool package demonstrating some of the performance advantages of Haskell. Yeah. Can you, can you put that in the context of robustness? It's so easy for someone to cause space leaks. In my experience, it's not actually very common to run into a space leak. I've, it's happened to me a few times. I've also seg faulted C programs and done lots of other things that break stuff. It happens. Uh, once, especially when you're a beginner, I still remember the first time I ever got a space leak. Uh, that one never left me. I remember that. It's ingrained in my memory. Uh, same thing the first time you seg fault a C program, I'm sure, is ingrained in everyone's memory also. Uh, in practice, I haven't seen it as much of a problem. If you follow, if you use lots of lists and everything is lazy and you write your own combinator functions instead of using library functions, you're more likely to run into it. 
most of the functions that are in Haskell. So the full, you know, fold functions, we have late, we have strict variants that are built in and recommended. If you use some, it should be strict instead of lazy. All of those things exist. Uh, so you get to avoid a lot of the pitfalls. Uh, it's more of a perception problem that people are terrified. Oh my God, I'm going to run into a space leak. And that typically doesn't happen. Okay, so vectors. Everyone knows about lists. Lists are the de facto uh, standard data type in every functional programming language. It's, you know, lists are nice and simple. They're a linked list pointing from one node to the next. They're immutable by nature. They're beautiful and they destroy program performance. Everyone knows how terrible they are. Haskell's not quite as bad as some of the other languages for lists because in many cases, we're able to exploit laziness and not create the entire list in memory. We're able to produce the list and then consume it at the same time. And in many cases, this can fuse and turn into this tight loop. Not in every case. Sometimes you really do care about holding onto this data in memory. This is where vector way outshines lists. This is the same thing as in C for having a, an array uh, with some advantages because it's not C. Uh, but essentially, that's the difference. Are we talking about a linked list or are we talking about a vector? Everyone can, you know, take normal algorithmic approaches to understanding which of these is going to be the better choice for various, uh, uh, for various problems they're working on. But if you're going to hold data in memory, vector is probably the right thing to do. Now why, now, why is the Haskell implementation of vectors so much better? We have a whole bunch of different variants of vectors. The default one is immutable as opposed to a CRA that I just referred to being mutable by default. So you're able to create this vector in memory, you're able to pass it around, uh, you can pass it to other threads, and you don't have to worry about anything getting modified. You can take subsets of that vector and pass that around too. Uh, we also have mutable for those cases where you have an inherently mutable problem. You, want, you have a million numbers and you want to sort them. It's going to be faster if you do it with a mutable algorithm under the surface. So you can do that. You can take your immutable vector. You can, uh, what we call thaw, we'll talk about that. You can thaw the vector into something mutable. You can sort it, perform any other operation you want to perform on it, freeze it again, and you're back into the beautiful, functional, non-imperative world. On top of that, we also have different representations in memory. The standard one is boxed, which can hold any kind of data type. But sometimes you want to do things a little bit more efficiently. You want to go directly into byte mapped, uh, into byte uh, memory. So we also have unboxed and storable vector variants. Uh, I'm not sure if I cover that. If I don't cover the difference between the two, uh, you can look up the information online. Oh, that's right. It's in the tutorial. That's why I linked to the tutorial. So if anyone who's curious about what is the difference between <coughs> unboxed and storable, check that out. Basic answer is use unboxed if you can, if you can't use storable. Now vectors have a very beautiful high level API. And this is the same API that exists for lists. It exists for a lot of other data structures in Haskell like sequences. And it also mirrors what exists in other functional programming languages. They might have different names. So we say fold in Haskell, other languages say reduce, uh, but it's the same concept. So you don't have to think about, oh, should I index, you know, I'm gonna index to uh, you know, 0.5 in the, in the array, none of, none of that applies. It can apply if you wanted to. But in general, you can just go ahead and take your vectors and treat them like a collection and do whatever you want with them. Uh, we have these common abstractions in Haskell, the foldable and traversable type classes. And they apply here as well. So you're able to just go ahead and use the, the same abstractions you build up, the same um, the same intuition that you build up elsewhere in the Haskell eco ecosystem and use it here too. We have something called stream fusion. You may have heard me say fuse earlier. Uh, we'll get there. And if you're interested in seeing a little bit more detail, I wrote up a, uh, a tutorial on the vector package. It's available at that URL, which you can get from the slides after I post them. So question. This thing looks like the worst piece of code anyone's ever written. We are creating a vector of a billion numbers. Here is one. And obviously that is going to take up eight gigabytes of data. Four gigabytes, eight gigabytes, depends on your architecture. In fact, if you compile this with optimizations turned on, which you should, 
if you compile it with optimizations, it only takes up 52 kilobytes. The magic here, and uh, as you probably are going to guess, under the surface, it's just turning in, into a very tight inner loop. So it's going to run a lot faster. So how is it possible that this thing that says create this massive vector and then sum it up is able to do this? The answer is stream fusion. It's a very, it's a beautiful technique. It's a, the paper is very interesting, actually. Um, it's a common response in the Haskell community. Go read the paper, and it scares people off outside the community. I don't think I read a paper for the first four years I was working in Haskell. Then I thought, oh, well, these things are actually easy to read. So the Stream Fusion paper is actually really well written and a very interesting read. Uh, but you don't have to know about that. You can simply use this thing. You use Stream Fusion, and things just go faster. And you don't even know that you're using it. It just happens. It's the best kind of magic. Um, a lot of this stuff, so yeah, it's on the next slide. This all happens via rewrite rules. So let's take a very simple example. We have the map function. The map function takes a sequence and applies a function to everything in the sequence, whether it's a vector or a list or something else. In theory, that first version, mapf.mapg, composed with mapg, that's going to go ahead and, well, if you're in a strict language, it's going to take an, an entire vector, it's going to create a new vector, apply g to everything, then it's going to create another vector and apply f to everything. That's terrible. That's horrible performance. Uh, Haskell, fortunately, we're already a little bit better than that because of laziness, because it's only going to apply it to one step at a time, unless, of course, you're using a vector, and vectors aren't lazy in that sense. So once again, you would expect this thing to perform terribly. In practice, we have these rewrite rules. And they're able to say things like, well, actually, you don't have to go ahead and create that intermediate vector. You can just compose f and g together, and this will work. And anyone who wants to can think about this quite a bit and convince themselves that this is a valid transformation. And if you're really unconvinced, I'll talk to you afterwards and try to convince you myself. Uh, one of the reasons why this works is because you yeah. might want to clarify for people who don't know Haskell the dot is function composition. Thank you. As Gabriel said, the dot here is function composition. So think back to algebra class, try not to cry. And <laughs> we're taking these two functions together and composing them into one function. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so one of the things that's going on here is we're able to take advantage of purity in Haskell. Uh, this is what, another term for this is side effect free. We know that the G function and the F function are not going to have any impact on the rest of the world. We're guaranteed that by the type system. So you're able to go ahead and apply that G function and that F function into any elements in the list in any order you want to without having any, any concern that you're going to mess up the way that things are appearing in a log or the order in which you bombed countries when you fired the missiles or whatever else it is that you're trying to do here. If you want to actually have side effects, there are different functions, and those functions are order aware, and then this rewrite rule wouldn't apply. But since we have this guarantee, we're able to take advantage of the rewrite rule. What's great about them, though, is these aren't built into the, G into the compiler. Anyone who's writing a new package can go ahead and define their own rewrite rules uh, whenever they want. So this is a very low barrier to entry way of writing more optimizations. Uh, and I'll mention it, one of the downsides of this technique, usually in order to get rewrite rules to fire, is you have to inline things quite a bit because that's the only way that you can really convince GHC to see that there's a, a rule that can fire. Haskell programs do tend to be a little bit larger uh, when compiled with optimizations. You can, uh, you can, of course, turn off the optimizations and then they won't be as fast, but they'll also be smaller. Now we're going, hopefully the internet connection is still working here. Wow, that's bright. Okay. <laughs> I should have thought more about background colors. Okay, so just to give an idea, a little bit of a performance idea on unboxing vectors and all these things. We're going to start off with a very simple algorithm of trying to, we're trying to calculate the average of a stream of values. Uh, and the way that we calculate this average is we hold on to both the total value of all of the individual things plus the total count. After we add all of those up, at the end we just divide total by count and you have your average. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of the details. What I do want to point out is that the data type here is defined with non-strict fields, the lazy fields. 
when you run the, and we're using an unboxed vector as well. I'm sorry, a boxed vector as well. When you compile this program and you run it, it, run, it takes up 397 megabytes of maximum residency, maximum memory usage, and it takes a total of five seconds to run. We're gonna make some minor modifications to this program. So the first modification is we just make these fields strict. So instead of having, and this is it, it's a one character change done twice. And once we do that, I think I also changed the loop function a little bit to be nicer to, strict, to make things strict. We, got, we went ahead and we brought that down to 83 kilobytes of maximum uh, memory usage and 0.3 seconds. So with very little investment, we're able to have very large payoffs in making things faster. And when you want maximum performance, instead of doing this thing with, um, how did I do this here? With lists and other such unboxed data structures, let's go for the gold, let's implement this as fast as we can. This, this implementation here is using unboxed vectors, it's using mutable vectors and, and all, the, all the fun evil things that you're not supposed to use in general. And sure enough, you're able to eke out just a little bit more performance of making this thing take up only 57 kilobytes and run in point, you know, 0.15 seconds. So this just demonstrates you can get a lot of benefits in Haskell for a little bit of investment. And when you really care about getting just, you know, you want to be neck and neck with C++, put in a little bit extra effort and you can still do so. So is this close to C, C or C++, C? You know, I, sh I actually forgot, I was going to test against Scala actually and I forgot to and then I completely forgot about C. How many elements do I forget? <clears throat> this was, actually, so it's nine billion. Nine, nine million, nine million. Nine million. Um, when we have such optimizations, uh, if I'm reading Haskell code, because I know the edges, my the half of my brain is strict, like whether it's whatever I'm reading is efficient or not, it's just like one more thing. So the so the question is, how do you determine when you should be? using these optimizations and when shouldn't you? Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Well, that's not the only burden we have in Haskell. You, you're looking at it. No, 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 let's, that's, that, you, you're like, a, you're in light years, light years ahead of the Haskell community. The way that most Haskell programmers look at this is, oh my God, this program, it looks like it's almost using a monoid. Can I change my data structure to form a monoid? That, yeah, you're, uh, that's, that's the way most people end up thinking about things. So yeah, we, there, you definitely can run into the trap of, but you know, thinking every time you're looking at a line of code, how am I gonna make this better, where better is faster, more elegant, more mathematical, whatever your definition of better is. <coughs> I'd say this is the blessing and the curse of being a Haskell developer. You know you can all, you know it's great, and you also know you can always do better. So you're kind of, if you're a perfectionist, this may not be the best language for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I can agree about it. Can some of these be done automatically with the compiler uh, some, so some, some optimizations are done automatically. There are some cases where strictness is applied automatically. The strictness analyzer is able to figure out a lot of things. Uh, one of the, I actually already mentioned one of them, which is the unboxing of small fields. That happens automatically. Uh, quite a few of the optimizations uh, with the rewrite rules happen without you knowing anything about them. So there are a large number of optimizations that do get applied, and that's before we even get to the just you know normal uh, register level kind of optimizations that the compiler also does. So yeah, you do get away with that. I'll just, I'm sure people here know the idea, I'll say it anyway. If you're sitting at your code and thinking, how can I make this faster? The first rule is of course, you know, check that you need to make it faster, profile. Uh, and I will admit many people who write Haskell code on a regular basis just want to make it as fast as possible and they don't do that, but that would be, if someone was on my team, that's what I would tell them to do. Leave that alone, ignore it. Yes, you can make it 10 times faster. Don't do that because we don't care. <laughs> okay, another interesting technique that we have in the Haskell world. Let's talk about Java. <laughs> and pretend like that's not up there for the moment. Let's talk about Java. I have five strings that I want to concatenate together. 
how do I do it? I do string one plus string two plus string right? Wrong? No? <laughs> that would be terrible, right? Because... Uh, Say again? That would be just in Java. Right. You would use a string builder. Yeah. Right? So in Java, you would use a string builder. Uh, we have this exact same concept in Haskell. You could take two byte strings or two text values or something along those lines, two vectors, and simply add them together. But if you do that 12 times in a row, you have you, uh, the complexity, the, yeah, the algorithmic uh, complexity is going to kill you. So you don't want to do that. Instead, we have this technique called builders, which is identical to the Java technique, except a little bit more nice because of composability. The way that builders work in Haskell is that we have this data type that represents an action that will fill up a memory box. Those actions can be composed any way you want. So you can go ahead and we have these, these rules. I talked about monoid earlier making fun of myself. Now I'm going to say that it's actually really cool because you're able to take this thing called monoid, which says some way to combine two different things together. We have laws governing how monoid works. We know that monoids are associative. So I can go ahead and I can put the parentheses any order I want. And we can use that to make things faster. We can say, hey, it will be faster if I concatenate it this way as opposed to this way. It opens up yet another optimization opportunity. Sometimes the compiler can do it for us. Sometimes our libraries are designed to take advantage of this. But the point is, you, when you need to make things faster, you can make them faster. And the reason you can get away with doing that is because of this purity and this mathematical nature that we've got in Haskell. Uh, builders, just so you know, are pretty well used in the Haskell community. I think every web framework uses them uh, to one degree or another. Uh, they're used in many other places, a, a JSON generation, lots of stuff, not just in the networking realm, I just have more experience there. So if you're interested, see Gabriel, I told you. So if you're interested in learning more about this, you know, SQL core performance, these are some libraries that I would recommend looking into. Uh, unordered containers I didn't mention at all, but it's got some very efficient hash maps and hash sets. Uh, conduit and pipes are two libraries for, large, for streaming large amounts of data. Uh, you may be able to find someone in this room who could help you with one of those two libraries. Hence, it's Gabriel. <laughs> okay, so we figured out that we can make our, our code really, really fast on a single core. I've convinced you all of that. Of course, no one has a single core these days. There's no such thing as a single core machine, right? Everyone's cell phones has, have 16 cores or something like that now. So we have to figure out, how is it that you can make things, how can you make things fast on multiple cores? Step in the Haskell runtime system. The Haskell runtime is built around this concept of green threads, lightweight threads. When you say fork IO, which no one should ever do because it's a low level prim primitive, but if you ever use this th function called fork IO in Haskell, it's going to create a green thread. It's not going to be tied to a new system thread. It's a very cheap call. These things are mapped to actual system threads by the, th by the scheduler. And under the surface, we actually use an invented API. You know, you can think of like libbyv or something along those lines. An asynchronous API is used under the surface <coughs> to know when data is coming into the system. For example, if I fork a thread and I block on a network, uh, on some network call, I try to read data from the network interface, it's not going to block a system thread. Even though it really looks like I'm blocking a system thread, that's not what's going to happen. Instead, the Haskell runtime is able to put that thread to sleep, work on something else, and once the data is available, it gets that no notification from the OS and is then able to wake up the thread all over again. And this is, uh, so I'm not making fun of JavaScript right now, but this is why Haskell is so much better than Node.js. <laughs> to demonstrate what I was just talking about, this is a very minimalistic a, uh, TCP server, whatever it is you want to call this thing. It's a very minimalistic server. It doesn't do anything useful. And someone reading it naively would say, wow, that thing is inefficient because this stupid program that doesn't need any throughput could never handle more than 100 requests per second. And the answer is no, that's not true. The answer is that if thousands of people decide they want to test this thing out all at once, it'll work just fine because we're not going to be creating thousands of system threads. We're not going to be making thousands of system calls that block. Instead, everything is going to be handled in a very efficient manner by the Haskell runtime system. Generally, schedule the scheduling governor, like who, you know, determines the schedule priority 
We, it's a very, it's a very rare thing. Uh, people don't, so to repeat the question, do we normally modify the scheduler or control the scheduler directly? Not really. There are primitives. Uh, the yield function from control.concurrent can go ahead and manually put a thread to sleep. Uh, things are preemptive in the Haskell world, so you could kill a thread with async exceptions or something like that. So we do have some control over it, but I don't think I've ever seen a, a use case where someone really dives in that, that deeply to modify the schedule. So for every single green thread, you, there's a corresponding OS thread, correct? No. Uh, so the question was, is there a co corresponding OS thread for every green thread? You could have thousands or tens of thousands of green threads and have them mapped to four system threads. Even one system thread, for that matter. Um, by the programmer or by the by the runtime? By the, by the runtime. That's only for IO or that's no, it's for everything. The way that so the way it works is these threads exist over here in this magical thing we're going to say is the green thread collector, and the scheduler will grab one of these and say, "You run on this run on this thread until I tell you to stop." So it goes and it jumps over to the system thread, it runs there. And then the scheduler says, okay, you're done, for either because it's blocking on I.O. or it's run out of CPU time, whatever the case is, it'll grab it back, put it back over here, and put something else on that thread. And the OS thread is like per core. So it's per core, it's an OS thread? Yeah, it should be. I mean, you can, you can tell the runtime manually to create more threads than you have cores, but there's no, there's no good reason to do that. How did, how did it stop CPU to CPU thread? If my green thread is just CPU. It's, it's, uh, so the question is how does it, how does it stop the, uh, these threads that are running? It's a tie into the garbage collector. Uh, sorry, no, sorry, the memory allocator. So when you try to allocate more memory, it checks whether it should put it to sleep. Also, when you do one of those explicit I.O. calls, that's another time when it could be put to sleep. So we're seemingly not talking about concurrency anymore. We're talking about some other feature, but you'll see. This is very much relevant to concurrency. Data types in Haskell are immutable by default. You can't change them. There are special data types like IRFs, MVARs, and TVARs that can be mutated, but in general, that's not the case. This is, this is a godsend for <coughs> writing concurrent applications. You can create a hash map, and you can pass it off to 50 different threads that are running. Uh, this is actually very common in network applications. And you have no concern that one of your threads is going to break one of your other threads because the only, shape that, the only state that they're sharing is immutable state. This is exactly what you want. Of course, there are times when you do have to deal with some kind of mutable state and you go ahead and you make that explicit in the type system. And the great thing about this is you then know exactly which parts of your program you have to pay the most attention to to make sure they don't break things. You also get your choice of what kind of mutable state you want. You get this in other languages too, but now it's a very explicit choice. You have IO refs, which are basically normal variables in other languages. You have MVARs, which are synchronized variables. You have TVARs, which are uh, software transactional memory variables. Uh, I think I have an STM, yeah, I do. I have an STM example later on. STM is a very cool technique for doing concurrency. Uh, once you start using STM, you can't figure out how you ever programmed any other way in a concurrent system. Another thing that seemingly isn't important for concurrency is explicit side effects. When you have a function that says, I'm going to take an integer and I'm going to give you back a string, in most languages out there, you don't know if that thing is behind the scenes reading from a file or doing something else. In Haskell, you know that it's not. In Haskell, you're given a guarantee, no, this thing is pure. This means that you're able to go ahead and use functions, these combinator functions like parmap that give you basically free parallelism. You're able to say, okay, take this list, I want you to apply this function on everything in the list, and by the way, do it on as many cores as you feel like doing it. You don't have to write any of the normal complicated code to fork threads, it's done for you. Tying into the green, the green threads that I mentioned earlier, it's also cheap. You don't have to worry about dealing with a thread pull and making sure that you're not, create, you know, you're not spending a lot of time allocating the threads. It's very cheap in the Haskell runtime allocate these threads. It's not free, but you can go ahead and you can create situations where you're going to bottleneck on thread creation, but relative to creating a system thread, it's dirt cheap. Once you have this purity, you also get to access something called software transactional memory. Anyone who's heard of this before, 
C Sharp tried to implement this, uh, failed, and the reason was because of purity. As opposed to in the Haskell world, software transactional memory, STM, was implemented in a weekend because it just comes for free. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of, unless it's in the next slide. Yeah, so I'll go into the details in about half a second as, <laughs> as to what's going on there. Uh, because of all of this, your code not only is, it's easier to parallelize it, it's easier to make it fast, it's also make it, it also makes it far easier to understand what's going on. You're not sitting there trying to keep in your mind, the men, you know, you don't need a mental model of all of the different side effects that are going on as you pass the control, the flow of control from here to here. If this function receives this input and, sent, and returns this output, that's all it does. Okay, so the promised example. STM. We're gonna do one of the typical big problems in concurrency, which is I wanna transfer money. Money is always a problem, everyone hates money, we all know that, it's terrible, right? That's why bankers are always miserable. So, I wanna go out and transfer money between Alice and Bob, our two theoretical people. I wanna make sure that when I take money out of this account, it goes into that account. If somehow there's not enough money to go out of the one account, I wanna abort that transaction and I say transaction in the financial sense. I don't want that transaction to go through at all unless I'm able to complete the transaction. I also wanna make sure that when I read Alice's account, I don't then get her account trumped by some other move by Bob before I complete the transaction. Lots of problems, you normally have to deal, most languages you have to deal with locking. You also have to worry about deadlocks because well what if I locked Alice's account here and I locked Bob's account there and now neither thread can complete. You have to go to weird things where you start ordering which lock it is that you take first. It's a pain, it's ugly, it's horrible. That all disappears. STM handles it trivially. So if you look, I'm going to concurrently, and that's kind of cool also, but I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm gonna concurrently do these three transfers. The transfer itself, first thing I'm doing <coughs> is I'm modifying the destination account amount. Anyone who's dealt with this kind of application before is probably cringing. No, you can't do that. You have to check if the, you know, the balance is available first. Eh, I'm gonna do it anyway. We'll see why. I'm gonna get the original amount from the source account. I'm going to figure out what the new, new value is. And now I'm gonna check if, I, I need to make sure that there's actually enough money in the source account to complete this transaction. If this check fails, the entire transaction is rolled back. This never happened. It's a lie. It's completely ignored and great. The whole thing just restarts and we're fine. Down here, I'm going to go ahead and write the TVAR and then the, the transaction completes because of this atomically call. You might still be wondering, wait a second, what happens if this TVAR got modified by another thread uh, between this point and this point? And the answer is, that can't happen. Everything is atomic, like that word you just saw. Everything's atomic, we know for certain that each part of this is gonna happen on its own. It, it's revolutionary how much less you have to think about, how much less you have to keep in your brain once you start moving over to something like STM. Wait, if the check fails, what happens? Is there some kind of error or is this problem? What do you, what do you mean? If the, check, if the check value is a fail, yeah. what happens? Okay. I mean, I understand what happens in the transaction, but how will it be if we can be handled by the problem? Let's say, oh my God, my, chair, my transaction failed, what can I do now? Okay, oh, so let me describe. I didn't actually go into the details of what check does. So check will retry. If oh. the, so if this thing fails, it will retry the transaction and it will keep trying again until it's able to succeed. If there's no way it will ever succeed because no one else is holding on to these variables and there's no way they're ever gonna uh, succeed, then an exception gets thrown by the runtime system, which is, it's a very ingenious uh, check. It doesn't work 100% of the time. There are, are, it's an undecidable problem in general, but for many common cases, it's able to catch the problem. If, on the other hand, what you really wanted to do is you wanted to say, if there's nothing available, then return an error value, well, you can do that too. Uh, you could throw an exception from inside STM. You could return, yeah, you could do whatever you want. This is just a silly example that no one would ever write in practice. Well, except me, because, you know, I love silly examples. Any other questions about this? Um, any concurrent transaction touching these accords will just wait until this is done? 
Say that, again. Say that again. There is another transaction involving one of these accounts. So, good question. I'm glad you asked it. So, will another transaction wait until this one is done? The answer is sort of. The answer is that it's, this is wait free. Other transactions are able to go ahead and make as much progress as they can and try to make a commit. If they succeed, great. If not, if, so for example, if two, di if two different, um, let me think of a good example. If instead of modifying both of these variables, if instead one of these variables was simply being read and not being modified, then we could go ahead and we could run multiple transactions at the same time that are all reading from the same variable without having to worry about one of those breaking the others. At the end of the transaction, we check if that variable is still in the same state it was at the beginning, and if it's in the same state that it was initially, then we allow the transaction to complete. Oh, the read transaction will get retried if the write transaction finished concurrently? Yes, I think, I think the answer is yes. I can, I can go into more details later. Um, after the after the talk, yeah, I'm not specifying anywhere here. Like a, I'm not specifying anything in the component of cash statement. Do this if the positive is this much. Do like, do this transaction. If it is. So to to For, do what you said, the read, we should make sure that. Well, so it is. I mean, it is doing the read. It's reading the TVAR and then it's checking. So, yeah. let's talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Okay. One more. Awesome, and this is, I love this. This package is amazing. Uh, it's written by Simon Marlowe, who is the author of most of the runtime system in Haskell. Uh, he wrote a book on concurrency and parallelism in Haskell. It's an amazing read. I recommend it to everyone. Uh, he also wrote this async package, which it's like futures or promises from other languages, but just handles a whole bunch of interesting corner cases for you automatically. It handles, it does exception handling in the right way it actually, in many, in many ways, it's able to teach you the right way to handle exceptions in general, not just in concurrency. Uh, it's got, got well-thought-out and well-named functions, and it even has some very high-level, uh, oh, both is in the right word, it's, oh no, it is both. It has these high-level functions like race and both, where you're able to say, well, I want to take these two actions and I want to just run them and tell me which one of them finished first. Or I want to run these two things and tell me when they're both, when they're both done. This allows you, once again, to step away from thinking about the low-level details of, I'd like to fork a thread, I'd like to create a synchronization variable to grab the information, uh, I want to block on that, I want to block on these two things at the same time. All of that disappears. You're able to do this at a much higher level, and, it's, and it, this is also built on STM, so you're able to do a lot of the same TVAR kind of actions when dealing with these separate threads. So when you're ready, you know, Twitter, obviously lots of network services. When you're ready to do some kind of concurrency, you don't have to start at the beginning. You can go ahead and build up from a well-known foundation. Warp web server is used by a lot of different web frameworks. It's, uh, it's very fast. Kazoo has done some amazing work there. It's got HTTP2 support. It's, it's all over the place. Um, I, I, kinda, I wrote the original bit of uh, Warp at this point. It's completely taken over by Kazoo, and he's done an amazing job with it way better than I ever could have done, so I'm very grateful to him. Uh, some other packages, data.conduit.network allows you to do things in a, in a very streaming manner for large amounts of network data, same thing with pipes network. And then the connection package, this is actually really cool. We have a TLS implementation in Haskell, it's a pure Haskell implementation, uh, so you don't have to ever rely on OpenSSL again. <laughs> and it's got a really nice high-level API in this connection package, both for writing servers and for writing clients. So abstractions. Uh, we've got 15 minutes left. If there, if there are any specific questions people wanted to ask, feel free to jump in now. Uh, there's quite a bit more material. Uh, doesn't all have to get covered today. Quiet audience. Okay. Let's talk about abstractions in Haskell. A lot of the ways people write Haskell in practice are built around mathematical concepts. This tends to scare people away. So, you know, when I say, well, you know, a, mo a monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors. Has anyone, anyone ever heard that one? 
It, I, you can ask Gabriel what it means. I have no idea what it means. <laughs> it's not necessary. You don't have to know these things in order to write Haskell code. You can get a lot of insight into it if you write Haskell code, but it's, you know, it would be similar to, well, I learned Latin, and therefore I understand the root of English words very well. That's great. It's beautiful, and you're able to do cool things with it. Uh, but you don't, it's not a prerequisite to speaking the language. Same thing with Haskell. Many people are productive Haskell programmers without understanding the deep concepts behind it. You can just take advantage of the fact that things like Monoid, which is a very simple abstraction, you're able to go ahead and build on top of in a nice way. We have quite a, we have quite a few of these mathematical or math-inspired type classes that are used all over the place. Functor applicative monad. Uh, don't ever, if any tutorial you read ever says a monad is like, stop reading it and read something else, uh, it will just confuse you. These are all actually very simple concepts that have become more complicated for stupid reasons. So don't read up. The only thing you can read is if you read something that says a monad is, monad is like a burrito, go ahead and read that. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have, I've mentioned monoid quite a bit. There's actually something which is more general than a monoid, a semi-group. We have foldable and traversable, which define generic ways to take a data structure and in, in the case of foldable, consume all the values into it into a single result value. In the case of traversable, uh, perform some function on every, everything in the, in, the, uh, in the collection with some side effects. There's a whole bunch more stuff along these lines. It's in this wonderful thing called Type Classopedia. There's a lot more beyond Type Classopedia. Uh, when you get to the lens package, prepare to have your mind blown. Uh, you can read about bifunctors and profunctors and lots of other fun things too. Another, uh, here you go. So streaming data is something that a lot of people deal with on a regular basis. Uh, how do you take 10 gigabyte files and, and process on them? You can write them in a low level imperative loop where you go out and you say, okay, well I'm gonna open up a file descriptor. I'm gonna read 10, I'm gonna read a thousand bytes out of this file descriptor. I'm gonna put it into a memory block. I'm gonna do something on it. And then I'm gonna put it back into somewhere else. No one wants to write that code. As soon as you start looking at these manual for loops, any kind of manual loop along those lines, you've lost. You know that you are no longer thinking about your problem, you're thinking about the computer. And you don't wanna be doing that. You wanna think about your problem domain as much as possible. So we actually have a few uh, very commonly used libraries to handle these kinds of things. Both of them are quality libraries. Gabriel and I have discussed and debated and argued about these things many times in the past. Uh, but there, you know, you can use either one of these. There are other libraries on, on Hackage too. Uh, IO streams, enumerator, iterity. This is, as you can tell, it's a wonderful place where people love to come up with new ideas. But the great thing is you get, and this is a general concept. The reason I'm bringing this up now, instead of thinking about how you want the computer to do the work, you need to think about your algorithm. You need to pop up a level of abstraction, and that's what these things allow you to do. So a little example to prove what I'm trying to say. This example takes all the data from standard input. It, may, it turns all the characters into uppercase data. It takes out all of, the, all of the letters E. Letters E? Yeah? Okay. It takes out every letter E that it finds, and then it spits it back out to standard output. You could do the same thing in a bunch of different lang uh, languages with different libraries. Uh, if you picture doing this in something like C, or C++ or Java, I'm sure you'll realize it will look quite different and quite a bit longer. And you would not be able to just go line by line and explain to someone, like I just did, exactly what the program is doing. The other thing to point out is this is all composable. You're able to take this concept of mapping and compose it together with this concept of filtering, and it just works. As opposed to when you write manual for loops, well sure, for this simple case, a for loop isn't that bad. But once you start adding more and more thoughts and concepts to a, to a for loop, it just becomes completely unmanageable. <clears throat> this is now on the more theoretical level or um, management level, one might even say, code management. You've written your beautiful application. It's perfect. It has zero defects, which all of our software always has zero defects when we finish writing it. We know that. Everything is perfect. And then your boss comes along and says, by the way, and introduces a new feature. We all know it's horrible, cringe, cringe time. Everything's going to break. You're never going to be able to guarantee 
the quality of what's going on here. In Haskell, it's the exact opposite experience. Many, many cases, many concepts, many features, many requirements, we're able to push into the type system itself. We, use the we take advantage of the fact that Haskell is strong typing and static typing to encode what it is we want our program to be doing. And then, when those requirements change, we update the types, and the compiler tells us everything that needs to be changed. It's not like there's some magic button that will just fix our program. We still have to do the manual work, but you're no longer going to be sitting around wondering, oh god, did I forget one of the places where now I've converted from centimeters to inches, and then you have a spatial exploding or something like that. You can go ahead and you can prevent that with a proper type system, and Haskell allows you to do that kind of thing. Restricted side effects. I beat up on this one quite a bit. You don't have to focus as much attention on your entire program because you know some parts of it are not going to cause you trouble. You know some parts of it cannot be reading from the disk, can't be doing a whole bunch of other weird things that you have to be more worried about because it's, to it's told you by the type system itself. And then immutable data structures,